Right. This is the regular board meeting of October 7, 2021, and is now 431. We begin roll call, Mary. President Lay. Here. Vice President Herrera. Here. Clerk Chavez. Here. Member Cortese. Here. Member Doe. Here. All right, we move to agenda item 1.02. So I wanna welcome everyone to the board meeting October 7, 2021. Are there any member of the public who would like to provide public comment to the board on a closed session agenda item at this time? See none, hear none. Then the board will now close session. Thank you. Let's move to Pledge of Allegiance. Please stand up. Thank you, everyone. We move to agenda 4.01. I want to welcome everyone to the board meeting of October 7, 2021. Member of the public, please submit your public comment online by accessing the form on the district homepage at www.esusd.org or the link on the agenda. Please limit your written comments to no more than a thousand characters in length. Public comments submitted online will be read into the record. You may also raise your virtual hand in Zoom to request to speak. You will have two minutes to speak. Please note, all meetings are recorded. All regular and special meetings to the Board of Trustees and Board Study Sessions are streamed live on meeting nights and are also available to for viewing the day after the meeting by accessing the district YouTube channel listed on the district webpage at www.esuhsd.org under quick link sections. The board is not able to respond to items that are not on the agenda or any personnel issues. The comment will be read into the record and will be directed to the superintendent and or the appropriate staff member for response. Interpretation of this meeting in Spanish and Vietnamese can be heard by accessing the link and following the instruction shown on the agenda and the district website. All right, so we move to adoption of agenda 5.01. The superintendent and a board member may request that items be removed from this agenda for consideration and or carry to a future board meeting for consideration and or action and or that the board take action in a regular meeting on a subject not listed on the published agenda on an emergency basis or other basis allowed by law, Gov Code 54954.2. None. Yeah, none. We move to 6.01, staff building equitable communities. We have, yes, go ahead, uh, take it over, uh, Associate Superintendent Teresa Marcus. Thank you, Madam President. For the month of October, we recognize the following staff who have worked diligently toward building equitable communities. Our first honoree is Roberta Cabigas. She's from James Dick High School and she's in the role of student advisor. And kudos from her principal read as follows. Roberta Cabigas is one of our student advisors. She's a positive and transformative force in our work to make sure we are truly moving toward a more equitable community. She constantly works towards improving our practice of welcoming all students as they are by facilitating courageous conversations with our staff. As an advisor, she goes above and beyond in connecting with students and parents on a one-to-one -one basis to encourage them to improve their attendance, motivate the students with the support of their families to make good choices both in and outside of school and truly work to build meaningful relationships with our students who need the most love. I truly appreciate the work that she does every day and her leadership at our school. Our next honoree is Karen Johnson, and she's a paraeducator at Andrew Hill High School. Hey, Karen. And kudos from the principal read as follows. Karen Johnson is a great example of being raised in Eastside and helping her community grow as an adult. She's always willing to help with any task as long as it benefits our students. 
Over the last 21 years, she has been a coach, club advisor, and a great classroom support. Students reach out to Karen with their life struggles and problems that go beyond the classroom instruction. It has been a pleasure watching Karen support the instruction and social and emotional needs of our students. She does a great job in helping students to de-escalate and to re-engage when the time is right. Thank you to Karen for doing all the little things that need to get done. Our next honoree is Alana Sagaria. She's an English teacher at Pegasus High School. And kudos from her principal read as follows. Ms. Sakaria has been instrumental in creating equitable communities at Pegasus where all students are welcomed and find their strengths. She has a fierce love for her students and is dedicated to showing them success. Her love of teaching radiates through her classroom. Our next honoree is Kavita Atwa and she's a school psychologist at Andrew Hill High School. Kudos from her principal read as follows. Dr. Kavita Atwa has been one of the strongest advocates for our Andrew Hill students. She understands that services and supports must meet the needs of each student and not just their eligibility. Kavita is constantly looking for ways to support both students and staff in order to provide the best opportunities for all. Andrew Hill has been lucky to have such a knowledgeable and strong advocate at our site. Kavita has been a constant source of support and knowledge for us as a staff. We have also benefited from her experience with MTSS and tier level of structures as the Falcon Way continues to grow. Next honoree is from Calero High School and it is Mr. George Flores, social science teacher. Kudos from the principal read as follows. George has gone the extra mile and has supported our new teachers at Calero. We are so grateful for his help with guiding and mentoring our new teachers. Our next honoree is Victoria Mendoza and she's a support services tech at Yerba Buena High School. And kudos from the principal read as follows. Mrs. Vicky Mendoza is being recognized for the work she has done and continues to do to serve YB students and their families. Vicky does a great job of ensuring that students and families feel welcomed and supported when she was a counseling technician. When parents come to the office needing help, Vicky always helps them with a smile on her face. Recently, she took on the support services technician position after many months of vacancy. She continues to work hard to support the Yerba Buena community to ensure that students get all the materials they need to be successful. And finally, recognize Crystal Glover from Calero High School in our adult transition program, and she's in the role of a one-to-one -one para educator. And the kudos from the principal and the coordinator read as follows. Crystal has been an amazing addition to the adult transition team. Her attitude, skills, and calm demeanor allow her to work with the students as they are, providing equity to all students she encounters. Crystal is conscientious, hardworking, and a team player in every sense of the word. We are lucky to have an individual so dedicated to improving the lives of those with the most support needs. Crystal leads in her classroom by example. She's able to assess situations in the classroom and adapt to the needs of the students. Her positive energy creates a warm and inviting classroom environment and her optimism and professionalism are infectious. Crystal's dedication to her profession is exemplified every day on campus. Congratulations to all our honorees for the month of October. Well, kudos to from our board member also to all of those employees that um, receive as the building equitable community. We cannot want to say thank enough for all of the service as well as all of your hard work during the pandemic as well as during the tough time to support our students. So I want to thank you, Roberta, Karen, Alana, Gavita, George, Victoria, Crystal, one thing is I'm really um, struck, I mean, looking to on of this question, but the question that I found out is very interesting, what is something that people may not know about you? And I'm looking to that is a lot of alumni, you know, uh, teachers as well as services staff that been uh, working and been going from uh, our east side um, high school. So that's something that I'm really proud of that people willing to contribute it, willing to go back to East Side and make it, you know, contribute it to the, our support, our student. So congratulations to all of you. Any other board member has any comments? 
Um, and so thank you all. Let's move to 7.01, uh, Pola Skoba for Student Governing Board Representative. Please take it over. Hello, everyone. I hope you're all doing well. Um, I'm happy to report that this week, the Student Governing Board met on Monday and um, some of our plans include raising awareness about mental health. I expressed this at the last meeting, but as we're transitioning back to the, this um, like in-person format, it's been a, really hard for uh, so many of us. And we wanna take this as an opportunity to make sure that students know the resources available for them so that if they need help and know who to go to on campus and know that we as a school district and as a community are there for them, regardless of what the situation is. And with that, we have some plans in mind in terms of making sure that students have a platform and are aware of this presence of SGB. We are planning a town hall sometime soon. And so we hope that um, you will all hear about this. And if you are a student, we encourage you all to join. We really want to get your feedback as to how we can improve our mental health policies and support systems within our district, as well as grow beyond the district and see what kind of options there are available to improve student mental health and the emphasis on that. And with that, we also have some plans regarding just learning more about how the school district works. We recently had a training last Saturday. And this was just a fruitful experience for so much of so many of us because we were able to really interact with one another and learn about how educational policy works on a local level. And I think my peers and I can both confidently say that it was such a great experience and that we're just so excited to continue our work in the student governing board and really hone in on the issues that directly impact us and raise them, raise them to the board and make sure that um, we're kind of developing on them and following up with our students and the people we represent. So with that, um, I'm just fairly excited and um, we're, we will continue to be meeting in the upcoming weeks. And I hope to give you an update about any other events that happen and are hosted by a student governing board. Thank you, Paula, for your work. This is a very good report back. And I know that one of the issues that you mentioned is mental health is very important. Uh, you know, we are concerned about it. And I, we heard you that we'll continue to work and support our students. And I know that when I visit uh, Independence, I saw some wellness center. It's very, very well, you know, developed. And I think students really like to see space and the, the center so they can take some time to go to the wellness center. Um, I'm open up for my board colleagues. Any question or anything you'd like to comment? All right. All right. If not, then thank you. We move on to 8.01. Superintendent and board member, my request that items be considered, discussed, and act on out of the order indicate on the agenda as per schedule. I did not see anything. I didn't. So then we move on to nine a public hearing. Operational item, no item on calendar under section. So we move to item 10, which is public member who wish to address the board. So 10.01, members of public may address the board on any subject, not on tonight's agenda. However, provisions of the Brown Act Government Code section 54954.2a and 54954.3 preclude any action as an unagendized item no response is required from the board or district staff and no action can be taken. However, the board may instruct the superintendent to agendize the item for a future meeting. Or any person may address the board any item on the meeting agenda. A person wishing to submit written comments must fill out a speaker request form via online submission. Please reference in your submission the agenda item number for your comment. Your comment will be read out loud as part of the public meeting if timely received during the identified agenda number. Comments should be limited to no more than a thousand characters in length. You may also raise your virtual hand in Zoom to request to speak. You will have two minutes to speak. I do have um, yellow, um, you know, a piece of paper for Julio Pardo. I uh, want to speak on item 10 and Julio is the president of CSEA and you have five minutes. Julio, could you step up on the microphone, please?
Will Pardo, President of CSA Chapter 187. Uh, I'm here to speak about the fact that there have been some issues in this district uh, since we have reopened the school. Uh, we realize that there are going to be problems, of course, that everyone come back after over a year of being gone. And so we, we didn't question them too much. But it's just some of these issues have been going on now for several months, even before summer uh, began. And this is something I need to talk to the administration about. I've asked you to, to meet with the uh, human resources, and I'm hoping that Mr. Vanessey also we can meet at some point. But these issues are coming to, to the, the fact that a lot of classified people are starting to get worn out. That's all there is to it. And we really need, I, I think the board has to start concentrating on taking care of the workers of this district. You've concentrated on the students and made sure that their mental health, their safety is good. You've concentrated on staff overall as to mental health and safety. But you have to look at the work of some of these people. And a lot of classified staff are having a lot of work thrown on their shoulders, certain categories that are just, it's just truth, truthfully, it's wearing them out. It's getting them frustrated. And if something's not done pretty soon, there's gonna be problems. That's all I can say, there will be problems. So I think we need to get together with the administration. We need to find solutions to these problems before they develop and just make things worse in the district. And I'm hoping that we can do that. We've talked out, we've had meetings where with the board with Ms. With Ms. Cortezi and with Ms. Chavez where we talked about the, the, uh, the fact that we all wanna to get together and try to be more open, be more, more transparent and everything. I think that's what we need to do here. We need to really be more open and transparent and talk the truth about what's happening in this district. I've spoken for years about the fact that classified is understaffed in many positions. And I think it's time the board has to take that into consideration because once we start losing a lot of our, our more uh, knowledgeable members who will retire, we can have a lot of young people coming in that yes, they'll be good workers, but they're gonna, they're gonna take them a while to catch up on things, which will make things slow down for other people. And we don't want that. We wanna make sure that we have the proper training. We wanna make sure we have enough personnel to do the work that is necessary. So I'm hoping that the district will meet with us and help us resolve these issues before we have bigger issues that maybe we can't resolve. Thank you. Thank you, Julio Pardo. And I know that uh, the superintendent will take a note and you know, we'll discuss later. All right, we move to 11.01, presentation, information, discussion, and action regarding update on novel coronavirus COVID-19, adopt resolution number 2021 slash 2022-6, authorizing remote teleconference meetings to November 6, 2021. Mr. Glenn Vanderzee, superintendent, please take it over. Thank you very much. Uh, tonight we will um, share some, as we've been doing since we've reopened, share some of just our, our public health data, some of our internal data. Uh, we'll share with you um, also the changes in the vaccine uh, status and the required of students through uh, Governor Newsom. Um, and then uh, we will be taking action tonight uh, regarding the format of our uh, board meetings, uh, staying in a somewhat virtual format. And this is an adult, a resolution that if adopted, we'll have to readopt every 30 days. And so we'll be looking at those issues tonight. The first thing I'd like to share with you is that our seven day as a county, our seven day rolling uh, day average of new cases at 154, that's down from the last time I presented two weeks ago from 223 to 154. So that bump that we saw at the end of summer, we're seeing a decrease in that. What we're also, are we are now is in terms of full vaccination within the Santa Clara County, we're at 84.2 and that's up from 83.5 two weeks ago. So we're starting to see, an, we're continuing to see growth there. It's kind of flattened, but uh, we have the growth. Our, our number of positive cases on this is a 10 day rolling uh, count, uh, not an average, but a count. Um, so within the last 10 days, there's been three positive cases uh, reported with staff across um, our district, 2100, over 2,100 uh, staff members. And with our students, um, that is down to six, where I believe last time we reported it was, was at eight. 
uh, with the adult education, we're that we have zero positive cases from teachers or students uh, in the last 10 days. And this is the data that we like to see. Uh, as you know, that um, it, the public health order went out that our our staff needs to make sure that they can we can verify their vaccinated vaccinated status uh, uh, and otherwise undergo a weekly testing. Uh, last time we reported out, uh, we were at 70% of staff that have verified their vaccination status. And as of yesterday, we're at 77%. So looking forward to staff and thanking the human resources and the team for messaging out. And thanks to all staff that are continuing to use the service to verify their vaccination. Now, things changed on October 1st. Our, our California became the first state to announce the COVID-19 vaccine requirements for schools. And what's that gonna look like? We'll find out. Uh, what we do know is that students will be required to be vaccinated for in-person starting the term following full FDA, uh, FDA full approval of the vaccine for their grade span. All right, so we'll be operating obviously in the seven to 12 grade span. Once there is the, the full approval, um, then they'll consider um, just the, the recommended uh, recommendations from the advisory committee. And then this California Department of Health will initiate the rulemaking process. And in essence, once that occurs, then they'll develop the rules. Once they've developed the rules for how this is gonna work, then they'll send it out for a public comment. And then after public comment, then the regulations um, will, be, will be sent out and to address uh, whether it's exemptions, the timeline, um, what a student uh, who fails or chooses not to vaccinate or cannot demonstrate vaccinated student uh, status, um, how are they to be educated? Um, currently, the, the language talks about that they have the right to remain in an ISP program, but not in person in, in school. You can see that that would put some strains on our system if a high number of students were not to be vaccinated. Uh, currently, some of the, go ahead. Currently, some of the, the rules for the current ISP as an option um, are, fine, are being a bit of a challenge for districts to report, to offer um, the way they, the independent study legislation is currently informed. So we'll see if by way of this, some of the rules regarding ISP become part of those changes and their recommendations um, that would come from this governing group. Once those rules and regulations are known, then we have to implement the following term. And so if they get this done in the short term, that might that could be January 22 for us, or it could be as late as for the fall in July of 22. We don't know, we'll find out, and we'll just continue to monitor this. But the direction is heading is upon that full approval, CDPH will get in the room, figure out the rules, invite the public comment, make its decision, and then the following term, we implement. Yes, go ahead. So this is in response to the governor's announcement that all students had to be vaccinated, right? Is that what you're saying? This, this essentially is the part of the announcement that I'm sharing with you. I'm right. sharing with you the, what, what was put out, some of the well, relevant issues for us as a district to let you know we're not starting next week. Here's, here's how the timeline's gonna work. So it sounds like the governor put this out, but, the, but that every little detail of the it's not thought through. It's, it's not, it's not it's thought not, through. Okay, so uh, for example, if a student doesn't want to be vaccinated for whatever, you know, some very legitimate reasons, right? Is there a provision for them to do what our staff would do? In other words, to get, you know, like test in lieu of, or is that unclear still, or? So you can see in that last uh, bullet point there, uh, right before et cetera, <laughs> you see the exemptions, right? So that's exactly the type of thing that I think is gonna get ironed out by this group, which is because there are exemptions that we know with the reporting the vaccination. And then for our adults in the system, we know there's a testing option, right? Right. So we'll have to see what this group suggests as as to whether testing is the option or an alternative form of program. And I, I don't wanna speculate uh, because I don't want certain truths to get out there or assumptions that this is how it's gonna offer but I'm, putting, I'm letting you know now that the, the details of the requirement, uh, the scope of exemptions, 
um, the nature of participation if you're non-vaccinated, if the rules for ISP are gonna stay the same or change so it becomes in essence more, uh, more doable from the, the, the perspective of districts and reporting obligations and get, um, uh, identifying time spent and all that good stuff that, that will be coming in the future. Okay, so this group is the advisory committee that um, working with the CD, California Department of Public Health? Yeah, so the California Department of Public Health will then oh, initiate the rulemaking, the rulemaking process. They're, they're basing their recommendations on this United States Department of, of Health and Human Services Committee. So this, I just want to know who, who is going to be the, the, what's the body that comes down and tells us the thou shalt? That's the California Department of Public Health? The California Department of Public Health currently has a list of vaccinations which are required. As part of this action, they are adding COVID, the COVID-19 virus to that, to that list and that criteria. However, they are, as I understand this, please correct me, counsel, if I have it wrong, in doing so, they are going to create a set of regulations in terms of the nature of the requirement, the exemptions, and then what an educational option should look like specific to COVID. Mr. Okay, Manager, that so can... that's, that's still underway. And our, the California Department of Public Health are not necessarily educators. Are they, do we know if they're working with? What, what's the process there? So presumably, hopefully they're working with CDE on this issue. Mm -hmm. um, so this measure was undertaken by the governor under existing legis uh, an existing statutory framework that provides uh, under the health and safety code that provides a list of all of the required immunizations. That, that uh, statute also has a catch-all provision. And so what the state is doing is mandating the student vaccinations for COVID-19 under the catch-all provision because it, it, it presents a public uh, health safety and uh, threat. And so that's why this rulemaking process will be so critical because it is you know, one of the newest vaccinations required for students under state law. So um, the CDPH has done this before, um, has implemented rules and regulations relating to schools um, and students. So presumably, yes, they will be working with um, the Department of Education. So, um, Glenn, so this um, vaccine requirement is effective as October 1st? No, the, what, um, what was communicated October 1st is what I'm sharing with you here, that there will be a vaccine requirement mm -hmm. that the once, uh, and it'll occur with different grade spans, they're looking at K-6, it's kind of a different phenomenon than 7, 12, uh, 7th to 12th grade. We know that there's been a vaccine available for st students 12 and older. So you kind of see where they're placing that there. Um, and so once, that, once there's a full approval from the FDA of a vaccine for an age group within the grade span, then CDPH will gather to create the rules of, um, of recruit the rules and regulations regarding the requirement, whether there will be exemptions. And as council just noted, hopefully working with CDA, a CDE, excuse me, to develop if there is going to be, a, if there are going to be recommendations in terms of an educational program or response that they would be in collaboration. They will, they will set up those rules, put it for public comment, adjust as necessary, and then put out those regulations. Once those are put out and formalized, then the next term, or the, for us, their next in essence, semester for us, we would so have to implement. They could do it as early and get all that work done. And we could be having to start in January of 2022. Mm -hmm. The other scenario is it's gonna take them a while longer and it might be uh, starting in July of 22 and that would impact us in the summer and the fall. I see. Yeah, thank you. Uh, any other board colleagues have any comment? All right. Um, 
So we don't need to have any action. So we, we do. do. So I want to communicate our next step. So we'll continue to monitor the data and provide the appropriate response. And part of appropriate response is we're going to have when we get up onto that October 15 date and see uh, what staff of the list, the 23% that still need to verify that vaccination. We'll start moving into that testing protocol with, with those employees. Uh, we'll continue to monitor just uh, our vaccine and our case numbers and our response to that. Um, and then also we'll be tracking this, this new uh, student vaccination mandate that, uh, coming from the state and their efforts to that. But on the agenda for you tonight as part of this item is also dealing with res um, a resolution. And this is the resolution that we discussed about uh, holding board meetings in a teleconference format and make sure that we're adhering to all the rules. And in essence, uh, this, the board has this, the new rules uh, changed. And we have, if there's a state emergency, we can enact this, the rules of continuing to hold our uh, meetings in a, in a teleconference format with the proper reporting, um, reporting actions taken the availability for the public to give comment, free to give comment in an unrestricted way. And so what we have tonight is uh, a resolution that essentially, um, that you can pull up on your screens there, I have it here. Uh, it's the resolution that essentially communicates that due to the presence of COVID-19 and its effects on our community, wanting to just in essence, allow people to, to attend virtually and still be able to uh, contribute in public comment uh, that this is a resolution um, to, to uh, choose that option uh, and knowing that we would have to return and every 30 days we would have to recommit to this resolution uh, measuring the, the health factors and also um, our response in terms of the, the appropriate format. So our current format of being here present together is fine. Um, it's the it's the virtual teleconference thing that we're that we're offering, and the ability for people to give public comment uh, and continuing in that format is the purpose of this resolution. Counselor, is there anything that I omitted there or relevant in terms of the adoption of this resolution? I would only add that the legislation um, requires that if the board adopts or chooses to to continue to have virtual meetings in this format there are new requirements relating to public comment and connectivity, um, specifically that if any time during a board meeting, there is a disruption in the connection that the board has to stop. It has to recess until the connection is restored. It cannot continue in its business. Um, and the other one is that the public has to be able to provide comment on a real-time basis, um, either virtually raising their hand um, and patching in through Zoom or by telephone. Um, in the past, the district has used a uh, submission of written comments, um, you know, before the board meeting. So the, the district is not requiring that anymore. It's, it's leaving that as an option for the purposes of this meeting. Um, but uh, the district can no longer limit public comment to written comments. It has to provide it on a real-time basis. Go ahead, Patty. Please. Oh, I, my question is: um, Is there a is this like a resolution that goes out into perpetuity, or like, I mean, let me give you some context for my question. I think that having meetings in this format, I mean, I think allowing people to when, when the pandemic is over, allowing people back in the boardroom, I think we would do and it's a good idea. But I also think that this format of allowing people to participate in our meetings by Zoom gives a lot more people access to the process, right? Because you've got people who are home with children, with adult, maybe dependent adults they're caring for or whatever, they can still participate in our meetings, even if they go late, right? There's, they're, they can, you know, I just think it's a convenience for the public to allow um, that to happen. So is this something that, since we're all meeting in person, that, is this something that is a, I mean, is that something that's allowed anyway? Or um, do we have to, is this something like that's per this special resolution for this special time frame? or? 
I, I'm not articulating this well, but do you understand what I'm saying? Yes, absolutely. Okay. So this resolution um, is if the board chooses to continue to hold meetings in this manner, this, nest, this resolution requires as a condition two things. First, that there is a proclamation or a declared state of emergency, which there is right now due to the COVID-19 pandemic. And secondly, there is a, either a requirement or recommendation at the local level for social distancing, which we still have in this county through the county's Department of Public Health. So we, if those two conditions are met, then this public body can choose to continue to hold virtual meetings in this way. However, to your point, your specific point, once the pandemic is over, if this body chooses to continue to broadcast meetings virtually and to allow public participation and comment virtually as well as in person, uh, it is totally uh, okay for, for the board to do that. That would be a separate action in the future. Okay, that's, that doesn't have to do with this resolution. And right. this resolution is really about if we needed to meet virtually as a, as a governing body. Yeah, under right? these specific under emergency these, circumstances. Right, right. But yes. since we're meeting in person anyway, this is really a little less relevant to us, right? Well, it, it is from, it, it's relevant because of the, from the standpoint of uh, social distancing. So without a resolution like this, you would have to open the doors to the boardroom and you would have potentially a boardroom filled with the capacity at 100 and, or 356 people, right. um, which would create its own risks and dangers. Right, clearly. Okay, I understand. Another eventual could be if one of you had to be quarantined because you're in close contact and would want to partic would still want to participate in the board meeting virtually even though you were not here. Okay. Can I add one other quick comment, which is um, the amendments uh, to the Brown Act um, were of course enacted in this time of, of COVID, but they would apply equally in the future in the case of any other uh, uh, natural disaster or state of emergency, like an earthquake, uh, uh, fire, um, bad air, dangerous air because of fire conditions, all of which this district has unfortunately experienced in the last few years. So. Thank you. Brian Doe. This resolution also cover when board members choose to, to participate in the meeting through Zoom, uh, him or herself. Yes. Thank you. Any audible comments? Um, I just have a clarification. So if I think I, I heard this correctly, we're having this so that we can have the option to go Zoom, right, virtual. Um, and people can access the meeting virtually and make comments and all of that. But that doesn't mean that we can't have people here in the boardroom. It's just limited capacity given the, given the pandemic. Yeah, so we can say there's actually, you know, minimum six feet, X number of people. Um, and once that is, the, the boardroom is full to capacity given whatever restrictions, then everybody else, their only way to participate will be virtually. That's correct, and I think that also goes to a question that Member Cortez raised, which I, which, yeah, yeah, yes, that's right. <laughs> okay, okay, great, because I, I just want to make sure that people don't think that we're just saying that the boardroom is closed and we're going 100% virtual. The boardroom is still open, limited capacity, given the restrictions, but the majority of people we expect to um, participate virtually. Yes, and. and the, the resolution, uh, the board would have to make this finding to continue in this format every 30 days. Yeah. So if these conditions persist, this will be brought back to you within 30 days uh, for renewal for, for another 30 days until the conditions are, are no longer oh. existing. Thank you. So now, um, so I can ask the student board governor representative to vote for us for the resolution. We need a motion. Oh, we have a motion, yes. I'll move, move for approval. Oh, oh go ahead. Go ahead. You move for, I, I think it has to be a motion on the floor first. Yes. Move for approval. 
Now, Student Governor Bo, how do you vote? Um, am I allowed to make a comment still? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, I think that this is a great first step in making these um, meetings more accessible, as board member Cortezi put it. Um, you know, as students, we don't have, like, a lot of us can't drive. A lot of us have to depend on our parents for transportation or have to use public transportation if we want to attend a board meeting. And with this format being the number one way to contact directly with the board of trustees, it's essential to have a virtual format because for the most part, that is something accessible to most students and that they can just log on and that they'll be able to contribute public comment on their computer. And I know it's like this not, that's not like that would have to be another resolution, but I'm just saying that this is a great first step in order for that to happen and for us to garner um, student voice on so many different levels and making sure that our meetings are, are, are accessible for all and that students are able to participate. And I think that should be a number one priority moving forward. And so with that, I vote yes. Thank you, Paula. Uh, Mary, you got the first motion. Okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 No abstention. Item 11.01 passed unanimously. Thank you. 11.02, discussion and action to approve extension application deadline for grade change for 2021 school year to pass, no pass to December 17, 2021. Mr. Superintendent, Glenn Van Der Zee, and Associate Superintendent, Teresa Marcus, please take it over. Yes, as you remember last year, there was some discussion around um, pass and no pass grades with Fs returning to no pass and A through D, someone could uh, choose a pass. Uh, earlier this year, we gave a presentation um, of kind of how not to correct a, <laughs> a problem uh, in when the state uh, adopted AB 104 and essentially gave districts 15 days to communicate that you can do a grade change and then families 15 days to request that. Um, subsequently, uh, people realized that might have not been enough time and that a lot of students and families learned about this, educated themselves and turned in forms after the 15 day cutoff. Um, and so we have it now a AB 167 and AB 167 um, changed the date for accepting the applications after the 15 day previous window to October 1st. Um, they community, I think they passed it that a week prior and then announced pretty close to October 1st, but essentially any, any requests that had been turned in after the 15 days that districts would accept those late application or late requests for grade changes. I think in the case of Eastside, it was about a hundred late. Is that about right? About a hundred requests that came in after our 15 day window? Yeah, there was an additional hundred from the original. I think it was 669 from the original batch within that window. So but the 669, the first 15 days, the hundred that came in, that's this, this now allows for the 100 to come in. Part of the language also in this is it allows a district to extend the deadline but beyond October 1st. And so in discussion with our counseling teams and administration, we're making uh, the recommendation to extend the deadline to the end of the semester, which will allow our counselors to continue to meet with students. And if appropriate, if a grade change like that, they can discuss that, make that determination if, if that's in the student's best interest and then make the change. In terms of the legislation, if you say, well, December 17, does this, is this the board have the right to make this action once? No, the board can make, can, uh, can take multiple actions on this item. Uh, but right now staff is just recommending uh, through December uh, to, to the end of this first semester, December 17. Motion for approval. Uh, I second. Um, I'd like to ask the student governing board representative, uh, what is your comment or how are you gonna vote? I realized my mic was on, but um, I vote yes. I did want to add that like, I feel like people should really also be encouraged to like um, recommend students to talk to their counselor to find out like what's the best option for them. Cause for some students like the no pass will like really help them. The students like, um, I know like someone talked about how you could change like for example, a C to a pass. And that might also be another option for students. So I, I think it really depends on situation and it's a great opportunity for students to be able to talk about their, talk to their counselor and about their grades. And I think also foster discussions about like post-graduation plans even. So again, really recommend that. I don't know if I said it yet, but vote yes. Thank you, Paula, for your comments and your vote. I was wondering, do we have any other 
comments for this item? Um, I did not see on yeah, the this screen. Is, this is a clarification. Um, so this is from last, the grades from last year, right? Yeah, so the, the qualifying grades for the request are from the 2020-21 school year only. Um, and what this extension would allow just to um, add just a little bit further context from the counselors is it really does allow us to triage in particular to start with our seniors who are currently in application process to allow them to have conversations where a D that changes to a P may all of a sudden change that kid to be eligible for a university. Okay, so there, there's some sort of plan happening with in conjunction with counselors. Yeah, we met with counselors. Yes, out. we met with counselors. Was it yesterday, Miss Or Wednesday? We met with counselors. Um, yeah, yeah, yesterday. <laughs> we met with counselors yesterday, and we did discuss, and 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 um, they were on board with um, working with uh, their caseload and looking at their seniors, um, in particular those that are at the cusp that changing that D to a P would really make uh, sense for them to be able to become A through G eligible. But they're also will be looking at like the other grades as well. Absolutely, yeah, we're just triaging. And so we're starting with their seniors just because of the application process right now. And then they're gonna look at all the students as well. Okay, and um, will there also be additional communication to our parents or guard and guardians? Yes, there will be. Um, now that we were just waiting for the action to be taken here, and then we'll we'll resend it. We they've act, we sent it the original time. Then we followed up after this extension to October first, and then we'll follow up once again once the board takes action tonight. Okay. Yeah. My 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 ask is, I think within the fifteen days, I think we did a pretty great job in different modes of communication. If we can make sure to replicate something similar um, to make sure that we get to as many families as possible, please. Absolutely. Thank you. All right, board member Joe. Would you kindly uh, update us as, before we get to the December seventeen? Whether we need to extend that deadline or or you feel that was sufficient? Absolutely. I'll keep Thank you posted you. as to the the number of unique students who have requested changes. By the way, once a student changed their grade from, let's say, for example, a D to a P, um, there's no going back, right? I mean, of course, there's also no incentive in that scenario, but, but uh, are there scenarios where it might be advantageous to retain the old grade? Yeah, so we, so we are allowing for that flexibility in particular during this quick time that, that parents, um, because it was right at the start of the school, it overlapped with before we even started. Um, the school year, there were some instances where the parents um, didn't really fully understand the grade change. Um, and so we had a couple of instances where we had to communicate with the parents to explain that changing A's to P's wasn't really in the benefit or best interest of the student. Um, and so we have had to make some corrections, of course, with the parents' permission to be able to, to return it back to something that was advantageous for the students as opposed to it negatively impacting them. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I was wondering, do we have any representative from ESTA uh, about this item 11.02 or not? Um, we did actually, we surfaced this at our last um, ESTA problem solving. Um, and uh, uh, Mr. Jack Kavner, who was the uh, ESTA uh, president, um, did not have any opposition. We offered uh, a different date if December 17th wasn't um, agreeable, but he agreed with the December 17th date. Thank you for update. Uh, any other board comments? If not, then we need to vote all in favor. Please say aye. 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 No abstention. The item 11.02 passed unanimously. I do just want to add one comment. Is that um, my gratitude to the staff for yes. working with our students. Mm -hmm. I know our administration, our counseling staff, um, so many people, uh, you know, uh, IT communicating people. Um, uh, it's been an, uh, all hands on deck, I know, and I'm just really grateful for, for that kind of support for our students. And soon we're gonna add a counselor to that list because they are the one who will be delivering our message. Yeah. Yes, and actually if I may, may just mentioned kudos to our clerical staff and ed services who have been doing the data input by hand and then having it transferred to IT. Um, Jeff Leisure, major kudos to him. He's done a great job of uh, doing the best that he can with the, with the, with the export and then making sure that um, the parents get notified. Our mail 
uh, room staff, our warehouse staff. I mean, it's been a truly a collective effort across our system. And so thank you, uh, board member uh, Cortese for, for that uh, appreciation. I also do wanna say it has truly been a, a district-wide um, concerted effort. So appreciations to the entire staff. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, uh, board member Pericot, as he mentioned, and also board member Joe. Uh, we really appreciate our staff will be involved, you know, for the uh, item that pass and no pass. And we know we appreciate our staff and teacher and counselor have been worked very hard to support our students. All right, so move to 12.01 presentation and discussion regarding English language learning language learner program. Ms. Marta Guerrero, Director of Instruction, and Teresa Marcus, Associate Superintendent of Educational Services. Please take it over. Thank you, Madam President. So Ms. Guerrero tonight will be presenting at the board's request um, our most recent approach and work towards addressing the needs of our English language learners. Um, she will provide our uh, roadmap that we will be using to inform our approaches and our strategies. And we're really excited to be able to present this to you uh, tonight. This is something that is very dear and near to both Ms. Guerrero and myself as we were both former English language learners. I'm sorry. Good evening, my name is Marta Guerrero and I'm the Director of Instruction. And I'm here to share with you the work of instructional services and of ed services, actually, all the departments in ed services, as we work towards building equitable communities and making sure that our uh, English learners are part of that, of those equitable communities. We want to make sure that when we say all students are welcomed as they are, we are including our students um, that need us the most, and that includes our English language learner population, that we get to know the strengths and the areas of growth of our English learner students so that we can respond positively to their very unique needs, so that in turn, they can meet that promise that we have made um, to their families, that if they send their babies to us, if they send their children to us, they will graduate uh, college and career ready. Um, you have seen this, this slide in other presentations, and it's a reminder to us in its services that um, our work, the center of our work, is that promise that we make as a, as a district. And that at the core of that, at the center of that, is that commitment of an entire system of educators, certificated staff, classified staff, to ensure that a student's background, their disability, their language proficiency, their gender, uh, their socioeconomic status, that regardless of how they get to Eastside, that we will not let that be the reason why they're not successful. And that we have a commitment, an obligation to ensure that we respond as a system, keeping the needs of our students at the, at the core so that we continue to ask ourselves, are our students achieving at high levels? Are they graduating at high levels? And are they getting ready for college and career when they leave our system? For that reason, you have seen a few times this, um, this graphic, which is the way that we are um, organizing our thinking and our planning in its services. And that is, how do we respond as a district? Not answer a question, not just solve a problem, although sometimes we have to do that, but when we encounter an issue, how do we look at it through the eyes of the board policies that you oversee? How do we look at it through the practices and procedures we have put in place? How do we look at it so that we can find the access points as well as the barriers that we create if we have either inconsistent practices, if we are not putting into practice the board policies that you, um, that you oversee? So I have taken um, the three uh, questions that you see in that slide to kind of center my conversation today to anchor the presentation around those three boxes. What are those policies we have in place to ensure that our students are achieving at high levels? What are those practices that we need to ensure that our students also achieve at high levels? And then where are those access points or those barriers that are prohibiting our students from reaching their potential? So, uh, next slide. I've also highlighted our obligation as a district because those of us at, in ed services that work day in and day out to support our teachers and our students really have this obligation at our core. 
the work that we do, it's not just a job. In, some, in a lot of ways, it's a vocation for a lot of us. We feel the responsibility of the families and, and that we have to families and parents because we ourselves are members of this community. So as we look at that obligation and we take it from all students and we actually focus it on English learners, then we're asking the question, are our English lear language learner students achieving at high levels? Either are they exiting our system as graduates? And are they exiting our system, completing those A through G requirements that are necessary for them to apply to a four-year university? So we'll start with the first one. We'll start with policy. Um, the question is what policies are there? So the board has policy 6174 around English learners. The policy, um, outlines the commitment that we make at Eastside and that you have put your signature to, which is that we commit to providing challenging curriculum and instruction so that our students become English proficient so that they advance having multilingual capabilities because a lot of them are bilingual and multilingual. And so they can be successful in the course of study that we prepare for them. It also talks about the importance of ensuring that the parents in the community, especially the parents of English language learners are involved in the development and in the assessment of these programs. It talks about the importance of providing effective professional development to the adults in the system to ensure that we're able to provide that instruction. And lastly, it talks about ensuring that we address the social cultural, social, emotion, emotional, social, cultural needs of our English learners. That's our board policy. That's our commitment to our community. And it's in black and white as the anchor and the foundation of the work that we should be engaged in in its services. Next slide. Mm -hmm. We are also guided by federal law, by Title III. Title III is a federal program that also outlines requirements for the funds we receive from the federal government around the work that we should be doing to serve the needs of our English learners. And it basically outlines something very similar to what our board policy states, which is that it is, um, they are expecting us to ensure that our students attain English proficiency, that they move from being English learners to fluent English proficient, that they develop high academic um, skills in English, and that they meet the same challenging state academic standards as any other student in the district. They also provide us the funds to ensure that we're able to do that, which should include uh, support for instruction, uh, which should include professional development, which should include uh, providing the students opportunities to become English proficient. In addition, we have the California English Language um, Learner Roadmap, which is a state policy around the way that the state of California expects schools to educate English language learners. I have highlighted some of the words. I'm not going to read it because a lot of work, words, there are a lot of words up there, but you will see that the words that are up there basically align to our equitable community statement. They align to our board policy, they align to the requirements of the federal government, and they are around ensuring that we, our students become English proficient, that they master grade level standards, and that we provide them opportunities to practice and learn multiple language, languages. So the students are not just bilingual because they're learning English and they have a home language, but that they have an opportunity to become multilingual learners. Um, on the, on the right side, you see the roadmap. The roadmap basically has four principles around the way that uh, we should structure our services for English learners. I highlighted the top left. You see a little line on top. And it highlights basically that the expectation that this is that this is a shared responsibility of all educators not just the English teachers, not just the English language development teachers, not just the schools where there are ELD programs, but all educators across the system. And that highlights the commitment that we as a district have to ensure that our responses are system-wide responses. 
In addition, we have our current LCAP, which names specifically our English learners in one of the goals. And it mentions the California English Language Learner Roadmap as the guide for the way we will design educational experiences for our students. So if our board policy, if our LCAP, if Title III federal plan and the California roadmap are all there and they guide us and they agree on the work that we should be doing, which is ensuring that our English language learners reach high levels of English proficiency, attain mastery of grade level standards and have the opportunities to develop fluency in multiple languages, then the question is, between policy, practices, and access, we have the policy. So what are the results of these policies? Next one. You have probably remember seeing this graphic before. Back in December, Kirsten King made a presentation as part of the KPMs, the Key Performance Measures. The data that you see up there is from 2019-20. We don't have yet the 2020-21 data, but the numbers around English learners don't change that much. Um, the, the data tells you that in 2019-2020, we had about 15.7% of our students as English learners, that the majority of them are long-term English learners, students who have been in the country six or more years, and that only about 38% are short-term English learners, students who have been in this country for fewer than six, six years. So if we're talking about 15% of the students are, um, of our entire student population is English language learner, we're talking about 3,500 or so students um, that have not yet become English language proficient. These graphs should look relatively familiar. They have a lot of information. The one that I'm going to highlight today is the difference of the graphs between the, the whole east side population, which is the one on the farthest right. This lets us know um, about the graduation rates of our students. As a district, we have an 86.4 graduation rate. And then you see that little green arrow that's pointing to English learners. Again, all students will graduate college and career ready. So there is a difference there between the way that our English language learners are um, achieving in our district compared to the general population. This slide talks about graduation rates when we compare those students who are in our local cohort versus those students who are not in our local cohort. Just as a reminder, because it's been a while since we had this presentation, uh, our cohort students are those that start with us on day one and leave four years later. They tend to do better and they are denoted by the blue bar on the slides. The non-cohort students, students are those students who do not start with us on day one. They can start on day two, they start on month three, they may come in in May, in April, they come in as 10th graders, they may come in at any time or move between schools. Those tend to be the majority of our immigrant students, our ELD students, our newcomer students, or English language learners who for work or any other reason have to move multiple times during their high school career. Their, um, the percentage for them is in green. And there is a big difference between our cohort and our non-cohort students, and a larger difference between our uh, results as a district and that of our English learners. The data that you see here is um, A through G completion rates for the entire district. The bars on the right-hand side are our district. We have about a 52.8% 52 completion rate for our graduating class of, of uh, 2020. But when you look at our English learners, there is a 22% percent, 22 of our English learners graduated uh, with our A3G requirements ready to go to a university. That is a big discrepancy between the two. And when you um, dig a little deeper and you differentiate the information, you disaggregate a little more and look at the difference between those students who are English learners in the cohort and in non-cohort when it comes to being ready for university, we find that those students who come to us 
after the first day of the, of, of the year who are not with us all four years have a completion rate of only 11 and 11.9 percent only only 11.9 percent of those students graduate ready for university whereas those in the cohort are at 19 percent but there's a big difference between our English learners and the achievement of our general population. So that brings us a lot of questions. And um, it was part of a, of a process that we started last year in ed services and instructional services. As we were looking at the achievement of our English learners like you, we sit through the presentations that Kirsten talks about and, and um, we look at those numbers and sometimes those numbers don't change from one year to the next. So we started asking ourselves some questions. We have the policies, we're looking at it as a system. So what are the practices and what are the access points that we need to dig a little deeper in so that we're able to, to change the outcomes because the outcomes are not caused by the students and by their background and who they are, but by the way that we as a system respond. So we started asking ourselves some questions. Is it about the materials? Are we using the appropriate materials? Is it about the instruction? Are we using the appropriate research-based, evidence-based strategies? Is it about uh, the professional development? Do teachers need a little bit more training? Are we supporting the whole child? These are students who come to us um, with different backgrounds and different experiences? Are we supporting the social emotional, the wellness needs of our students? Are we only talking about academics? Are we providing enough supports during the day with designated ELD, English language development classes? And as we, these were only some of the questions that came up as we kind of started thinking, okay, so where do we start? We know that this is an issue, where do we start? Um, I've highlighted what kind of instructional support can we provide teachers? We were able to, find, to have um, a quick response to that in that we were able to hire a teacher on special assignment to support the needs of the teachers so that they in turn can support the students. Um, he's been quite busy. He sent out emails to the teachers and saying, I am here to support you. And not only just teachers of uh, the ELD classes, the English language development classes, but teachers in sheltered classes, as well as department chairs have been reaching out to him. So that's a little step forward, but one of many, right, that we still have to take. We even had a basic question like, and you see the last question there, who are our English learners? We talk about them as if they are a homogeneous group, English learners, when in reality, we have newcomer immigrant students. We have newcomer immigrant students who come with a strong educational background. They, they are ready to just accelerate and keep moving forward. We also have newcomer immigrant students who come with interrupted education, interrupted schooling, our refugees, our students from war-torn areas, students who had to work, students who come from countries where mandatory age for education ends at the sixth grade, right? And then they get, to, they get to the United States and we want them back in school after they've been out of school for a while. How do you support them? How do you support those varying needs? What kind of different programs do we need? We also have long-term English learners. Some of these students are former newcomer students. They just got here when they were in third grade, fourth grade, whatever. Other students are born and raised in this country. American citizens who are still at ninth, 10th, 11th grade considered English language learners. We also have students who come, come here as young children and are still English language learners. How do we serve them? Because their needs are different than our newcomer students. We have English language learners with disabilities, mild to moderate disabilities, some of them with moderate to severe disabilities. There's different, um, different needs. Do, what are we supporting? Are we supporting the, the, the disabilities? Are we supporting the English language learner uh, needs? Are we supporting both? Um, you see the three little dots because we could probably find more different uh, types of English learners if we just look a little bit more. So as we're looking at this, we, keep asking, we kept asking ourselves, where do we start? There is all this work, where do we start? What questions do we ask? And do we in instructional services 
have the expertise to undertake this work because this cannot be haphazard work. This is not the work of, I think I should do this. We should try. This is work that needs to be grounded on research, on evidence-based strategies and practices. So we contacted WestEd. WestEd is a think tank, an educational um, uh, organization that supports school districts in, their, in improving their practice and their work. We met with their uh, division for English language and migrant ed education, explained all the things that we, uh, we found and all the answers we wanted to find. And um, they've agreed to work with us for the next year and a half. I know that the scope of work says October 1st. We have not started because the contract will come to you on October 21st and we're following process. So we have to wait. But I wanted to share with you about the work that we are engaged in because the numbers for our English learners have not changed. But the way we are going to work and the, and the, the organization under instructional services is going to change. So they're going to take us through a three-part process of collecting and analyzing data, of interpreting results and planning for next steps, and eventually of defining effective practices. This is not just the work of one person. This is the work of all the uh, different departments under the direction of, uh, of Ms. Marquez. So this will be work where assessment and accountability and Kirsten King will be an important person because we'll be looking at data, collecting data, disaggregating data. Um, student services will be involved because it requires supporting the needs and finding out how we support the needs, the social, emotional, and wellness needs of our English learners. It will be the work of special services because we will be talking and learning about our ELs with disabilities. And it will be the work of instructional services because we will be talking about and looking at and digging into how we teach, what we teach, what uh, instructional materials we use to support the varying needs of our English learner population. We will start with an expanded leadership team. This is not work of the directors of ed services. We will have members of our cert certificated staff, um, ELD teachers, teachers of sheltered courses, um, we will have ed, uh, an ed specialist and we will have a teacher on special assignment as well as our English curriculum coordinator. We will also have some administrators and um, there, there are more certificated staff than administrative staff, but we cannot leave the administrative staff out of the, of the team because for each administrator that's there, let's say that uh, me or Kirsten, we impact a whole group of people that will come aboard as part of the work. We will also have three APDs um, as part of the work. They have volunteered. And uh, like Ms. Marquez said, there are a group of us who are former English language learners for whom this work is work of the heart. And there is just no way that I can say I only will take one APD, right? Um, Noed Din from um, our coordinator of academic uh, language will also be part of the work. So we will have two coordinators, uh, two directors and three APDs along with the certificated staff to be part of this team. The scope of the work will be um, in four phases. First of all, the goal. The goal of the work is to develop a vision for English learner education grounded in principles for high quality English learner instruction so that we can incorporate it into our master plan for English language learners. Um, currently, we do not have an updated master plan uh, that aligns to the California roadmap, and that is going to be the work. So it will be, um, you will see, you see some of the activities that we will be uh, engaged in from interviews to classroom visits to shadowing students to find out what their experience is like, um, to reviewing data, we, that team that you just saw in the previous slide, will undergo training. We will not be able to do this work if we're not all aligned and are looking for the same thing and are using the same in instruments to do the work. There will be also um, interviews by the ELM staff, which is the English Learner Migrant Ed um, Services Department of West Ed, uh, with different stakeholders, including students and parents because we wanna know their experience as well as either English language learner students or parents of English language learner students. 
We will review the curricula, the materials, the textbooks that we use, the assessments that we use, not just to find out if the students are moving along, but the assessments we use for placement to ensure that those students who are ready to accelerate have that opportunity and those students who need more support also have that opportunity. We will review the pathways to post-secondary opportunities. You saw the percentage of students who are ready for A3G. We need to ensure that we have pathways for our students that once they leave us, they are ready to, to start their life, whether it's at a university or at a job. And eventually, um, the last phase will include receiving a report from WestEd um, and figuring out the plan for the next steps. Now, there's a lot of urgency in this. Everybody that I've talked to, as, I've, as I, we have um, talked to certificated staff and administrators to be part of this work, everybody wants to get it down yesterday because there's a love and there's a need and it's taken uh, some time for people to understand that this is a system response, that this is methodical, systematic, and that we will take it one step at a time because we want it to be long lasting. So even though we're doing this work, I just wanted to make sure that we kind of circle back to the commitment we have made to ensure that MTSS is the framework. And as we look at that triangle, with tier one work. Tier one work is around high quality instruction for all our students. Students is about bringing together academics, responses to behavior and wellness supports for our students. You've noticed in the language from board policy, Title III, the California roadmap, um, it aligns to academics, behavior and wellness. And the work that we will be engaged in is directly related to creating that tier one experience, instruction, responses, interventions for our English learners. Our English learners are not tier two. They are not tier three. They are not uh, in need of something else. They are our students. They are tier one. And we need to make sure that we design that tier one instruction and support for them um, so that we are able to address their needs. So our next steps, we're in the process of building our leadership team. I have some emails out for people who have expressed uh, interest, as I've mentioned, the APDs, some teachers. We want to make sure we have representatives for almost every school um, as part of the team. Uh, then we will engage in the review. And hopefully sometime in the near future, I will be back to let you know what the outcomes are of the, of the study. That's it for me. Do you have any questions? Wow, thank you, uh, Ms. Marta Guerrero, <clears throat> for the presentation. I know that uh, <clears throat> English learner subject is uh, once very dear to my heart. Because I, one, one time I've been in that shoes and I know how hard it is. Uh, I'm looking to the report when you mentioned about <clears throat> the 72.3% English learner uh, graduated compare with 80, 85 of 86 percent of um, our East Side Union High School District. Um, I was wondering that uh, the, the gap is still there, but how could we support them in a way that to move up, you know, I mean, every year, and you, you probably have some report come out every year, but uh, you know the, the, the difficulty that the, the student have to bear with when they come to an, a new country, new culture, and when they don't get the good support, they probably feel that they will drop out or someone did not really care for them, their family might not get that type of support because parents probably would not speak you know, English well in order to support them. So I was wondering that, do we have a after school program or any other support uh, for the ELD, the English learners uh, student? Because if we support them for the ground, 
the foundation. When they move up, they would be stronger. Mm -hmm. So they would not be dropped out. Because like I've been there and I know the whole uh, things in my mind that, you know, I'm probably not going to make it. And I'd rather drop out rather than continue. Or someone will hold my hands that, yes, if you don't make it, but still, we still have some time for you to catch up. Mm -hmm. Or if, if they get older than 18 years old and they could not pass, I could not graduate it, what are we going to do with those students that really make a big impact? Because I, you know, like I said, every time I talk about English learner, I'm always reflecting my mind that I didn't have that type of support back in 40 years ago, but now we have many more support but the percentage of the graduation still is a big gap compared with our student. So what you, what you plan to support them in which way uh, so they can motivate it as well as stay in the school and learn and feel like, uh, all right, I couldn't graduate it. Maybe I'm gonna get out and I probably get a job or somewhere else because I couldn't do anything else. So how did you look into that you know, subject and that issue? And can we move up the percentage mm -hmm. uh, for the ED out? I think slowly we're making strides. And one of the things that's going to have a big impact is gonna be our commitment um, to ensure that our ELs, if they need an extra year of high school, if they need to return as fifth years, they can do so. Being an English learner, as a former English learner like you, becoming English proficient takes time. We can't hurry the process, right? So we're not going to go from not speaking, in, we're not going to go from no, not speaking English to being English proficient in three years or four. It may take five. So providing them an opportunity to return, to, come, to, to practice, Just to absorb to learn pronunciation, to be able to develop skills, I think becomes important. Mm -hmm. We have... Um, some of the same uh, supports that we have for everybody else are available to our English learners. They're able to make up some classes through Cyber High. Um, they're able to, if they need it, take an extra class. But I think some of the work that we're gonna be doing with West Ed from the beginning, what are those, finding out who they are, um, figuring out what supports they need and differentiating the different pathways, accelerating those students that come with um, strong skills in their home language who are just able to make that shift to the English language, they will just soar. Whereas those students who need supports, providing them those extra supports that they need, mm -hmm. figuring out what we, what we could be doing that we are not currently doing. Um, currently, we provide tutoring, we provide cyber high, we provide an extra class if they need it. Um, we have, uh, this year, we went back to hiring bilingual paraeducators to the for the schools where we have those ELD hubs so that they can get support in their language if they need it right. Mm -hmm. um, the support that we're providing from uh, Mr Solis to ensure that the teachers mm -hmm. who don't know what to do, even though we may all have it as part of our credential that authorization to support English learners. Mm, sometimes we need that extra support as to what strategies in particular, I believe that not just through this support through the excuse me through this review, but also with um, understanding the needs of English learners and that sometimes we need a little bit more time. Mm -hmm. Heck, I've been in this country for 40 something years and every once in a while that English still fails me, that word disappears, right? You're always there. Yes. It's, it just is what it is because you carry that first language with you that pops up first, exactly. that kind of wants to come out uh, mm -hmm. whenever you're struggling for a word. So um, it is my hope that with all of these efforts, we'll be able to impact that, that, those numbers. I was so wondering that uh, was your goal to increase the percentage, like maybe a year from now or two years from now, 2% or 5%, you know, compare with, you know, our um, ISA Union student graduate ratio, as well as A to G completion. So something that you can bring back to the board and said that, yes, we did make some progress, maybe 2%, even though the goal we set 5%, but at least we make some progress. Yes. Yeah. Right. And if I, let me address that, Ms. Canedo. So 
Um, the beauty of this is the alignment that Ms. Guerrero talked about with the LCAP. If we refer back to the LCAP, we actually have those targets listed in the LCAP. And so we're looking at um, minimizing that gap. And so we have our English learners at making 10% strides within the year. And so not only do we have them embedded within each of the individual goals within the LCAP, they have a goal of their own where we've identified the metrics mm -hmm. of what we're going, how we're going to measure it. So the excitement in my voice is because the alignment is coming together where we have the roadmap, we have the LCAP that's going to speak to our metrics. And so um, really excited about that question, Madam yes. President, because we've identified those metrics within our LCAP to really make it a living, breathing document in connection to what Ms. Guerrero has just presented. That's awesome. My last question is, um, during the pandemic, our students are suffering, you know, no matter you are ELD or you are non-ELD. So do we have um, a little bit more support for the ELD, uh, you know, during the time that they could not go to the classroom, they have to study through Zoom. It's much more harder for them because with hands-on experience or when they see the, the teacher, you know, during the classroom, then it really be very helpful. So what is your experience or how did you compare and how could you look into that issue during the pandemic? The uh, English proficiency is attained if we practice, if we practice daily, if we practice listening, speaking. Um, and during the pandemic, when kids were at home, it became difficult to do that. So I do know that the ELD teachers have voiced um, some of their concerns that the, um, the progress that they would normally see um, is not there. But that is a concern across the board for all our teachers, it, not just for our English learners. So right now, I can tell you, because I just had the email, that NUEDIN is making sure that we provide Rosetta Stone, not just to our ELD1s, but to our ELD2s as well, so that they can practice at home on their own, um, their, their listening skills, their, their um, speaking skills. Um, we know, coming from immigrant households, that the TV is in your home language, that the radio is in home your home language, that you talk to your parents in your home language. And that's a beautiful thing because you do not want to lose your home language. But then comes the challenge of how do you, um, how do you grow your proficiency in a second language when you only hear it at school? So, Thank you. That's a very good answer. Go ahead. Uh, remember, Travis, you have a question? Do you have a short one, Manuel? I think so. Okay. okay. Uh, go ahead, Board Member um, uh, Herrera. I, I'm wanting to ask um, Ms. Marquez if we can have uh, Thomas Brittendahl signed up for a comment because I'm noticing he sent a comment on this agenda item to the board. Um, and if he's not signed up for it, then I'm going to refer to his brief comment. Um, this item? Yeah, I on this item. Yeah, I do not see written public comment. So, so the comment that, that he makes, it's brief uh, on the question of do we need additional designated English language development ELD courses to address the needs of our English language learners. He continues my answer, absolutely yes. Two years ago, I taught a sheltered US history course that had a total of 16 students. Uh, in that class, I had the most precious resource a teacher has with their students, time. As amazing as most of my students are this year, it is too much to ask of a teacher to allocate the proper amount of time to the students who need it most when the class size is 32 and the population is made up of a high percentage of students who have special needs. Taking note of that comment. Thank you. Member Chavez. So much gratitude. All the connections. Every time I ask, okay, how is this connected to this, to this, to this, to, this, to everything? And it's all here. So thank you. Thank you so much for, for putting this together, for providing that clarity. Um, yeah, it, it, one of the first questions that I had for you is, do you realize what you just did? Yes, and I'm very excited. <laughs> Good. This is what I hope to see every single meeting moving forward. Oh, you mean about the present? I'm excited about the work. This is both. Yeah. Both. Because I think as a district, I remember one of my first meetings, Kristen King was standing there, poor mm -hmm. woman. 
she got she got it from me because I saw the date and it was my first interaction and it's just like poof. Um, but then that was it. It was just the data sharing. There wasn't no connection. I didn't understand what the district's thinking process was, how they were making any connections with different systems, the questions that they were asking themselves, who were they thinking of working with, to what end, so on and so forth. And this, this did all of that. So I have to tell you, it was Kirsten who brought up to us the fact that here she was going to come and present to you data that was the same from previous years and that we keep repeating this and in some ways when we're not if we if we don't frame it correctly it's as if we were putting the blame on our students mm -hmm. and that indeed this statement of our obligation around it's not um the student's disability uh their gender all of that but it is our system the way we respond that came directly from kirsten king i know i said it services but it was because of her frustrations in presenting data yeah. that looks the same year after yeah. year. Thank yeah. you. And I think I have things. to, yeah, it was, it was her. And I think what came from that, from the team was this notion of the system's response. And so if you remember when we came back with Kirsten's data, it looked different, right? It was, how do we respond as a system? What are those gaps in the system that are coming through to then make that, um, that shift in the actual data itself. And so now you see the LCAP that is connected with the clear targets that are connected directly to the KPMs and the actions are now aligned through a systems lens. And so um, absolutely, right? We heard you, we, we know what you were asking for in terms of um, not only the strategies and the approaches, but what are those outcomes, right? Yeah. That are gonna then get shifted as a result of that. So, um, yeah, you, you called us to action and here we are. Yes, 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 yes. And you know, I, I will share a noticing too, the very first slide of equitable communities, the very first like sentence or two speaks to capacity building. I just, I, I was telling Glenn and I don't know who else, I've been visiting school sites and a trend that I see is an opportunity to build capacity. And that means many things. Um, specifically for our teachers, starting with our teachers, because our teachers are the ones who spend the most time with our students. And that can mean um, instruction skills, how to um, support students um, from a social emotional lens, you name it, it's multiple stuff, but all of that is ultimately capacity. Um, and when you look at your report, the very sli last slide, step four, talks about the outcome being how, what is that capacity going to look like? So I just want to share the, the connection and the noticing where I think that is the biggest opportunity. And that excites me so, so much because yes, we have a lot of great work, a lot of skilled teachers, um, you know, innovations here and there. And to your point, Martha, our data has not moved in years. And so there comes a point where, where we ask ourselves, well, what else can we do? Let's talk to the think tanks. They're doing research, right? Um, and so I, I'm just so thrilled to, to see that this is happening so that we could broaden our, our, our knowledge and build that capacity and figure out what is it gonna mean to support, to, to your point, Manuel, um, teachers like um, Thomas and, and others, right? Because um, one person can do it, Mr. Solis can't do it for everybody, right? We're serving 22,000 students, I mean, even if he was like the greatest of all time, it, it's just impossible. Um, throughout this whole um, presentation, I, I really felt and heard equity, serving our students and meeting their specific needs and bringing out like, our students are not just ELLs, like English language learners. There's a wide array of English language learners. And then you add multiple layers. Are they students with special needs, foster youth? it adds to, it spices things up <laughs> to their experience. And that has to be acknowledged. And in addition to that, something that I think is really beautiful and so important is our parent perspective. Then you brought that up. Like how, how are we involving our parents, right? And there's interviews mm -hmm. where they get to speak to what is their experience? Where, what gaps do they see? So I'm just so excited to see what's gonna happen. And, and I hope that once we pass this contract, um, approve this contract, 
that we get clear on what is the timeline going to look like when we get reports. And if there's an opportunity for us to be involved, I would really love to be involved <laughs> and, okay. it, it, and see, you know, how, how this research continues to, to, to develop. Um, just ultimately, just want to say thank you. I'm feeling so much appreciation and already see this, this work um, going to, to the next level. So, and I know that, that that is a culmination of a lot of things, Ms. Marquez. Mm -hmm. Uh, probably hearing me nag a little bit um, here and there, say the same thing, but it um, takes a great leader to support their staff. So Ms. Marquez and, and Mr. Vanderzee, thank you for, for supporting team. And, and Marta, you've taken on a really important role <laughs> in a really special time. So that has to be acknowledged. Gracias. Thank you, board member Chavez. Uh, any other board comments? Board member Patty Cotizzi? Um, I'm practically speechless because um, this is so powerful what you presented tonight, what you're embarking on. Um, you know, it occurs to me, you know, I love what you said about that it's, that this is tier one and that what you do for our ELL students may very well support so many of other students who struggle with, you know, basic, you know, literacy and, and, you know, reading, writing, arithmetic kind of stuff, you know. Um, so I, I just, I can't wait to see how this goes. Um, Weston, I don't know much about them. Are they more than just research? Like, are they practice or they're, so, so someone is bringing stuff that's been actually like it demonstrated works in the field. They're nationally recognized for the work that they do with uh, school districts, and they support them in a variety of ways, not just uh, in the work with English language learners, but putting in systems in place, um, helping um, school district uh, look at data or anything that, that is needed in education. They work actually with nearby school districts as well. And we have worked with them in the past with, um, when they've provided individual professional development opportunities. But this is not just about professional development. That will come. This is about looking at the whole structure, the whole system, and pinpointing the access points and the, barrier, the barriers more than anything else, yeah. and the practices or lack of practices, um, because we have the policies to push us forward. Yeah. It's just where it is that we can um, do better. Yeah, so it's just giving you, um... You know, those opportunities that are hiding in plain view, I guess, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I know, so this is, this is a huge thing you're embarking on, um, but, but I hope part of it is also looking at our relationship with our feeder districts, mm -hmm. because, you know, you talk about kids who've been here for six years or longer, right? If they're, you know, mm -hmm. and I, um, so I'm back in the classroom as a sub, and um, I can, I've seen how these kids struggle and I see how the teachers struggle and I see how I struggle myself as a teacher. And I'm only there for a day or two or something, you know, so, but interestingly, no one has ever given me an instruction. This is how you work with this student. I mean, and no shade on my employer, but um, I, to me, that's just a missing that's, right? Part of the conversation we had was around language acquisition. Um, what type of language acquisition training do we give our ELD teachers, our English language development teachers, to support the needs of students who don't speak English and they walk into their classroom? And so that's uh, another growth area for us. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Thank you, Ms. Marta Guerrero, and also Student Services. Uh, Teresa Marquez and Kristen King and all of the student services staff have been a strong support. And especially for this presentation, it's a lot of works. We appreciate that. So no other comments, then uh, we can move to 12.02, discussion and action to ratify approved school field trips. Mm -hmm. Teresa Marquez, please take it away. Uh, it's just one field trip listed and it's a local field trip, not an overnight. So it falls within the recommendations that we have adopted and I'm asking for approval by the board. I'll move to approve. 
All right, Mary, you get first and second from uh, board member Herrera. Uh, the student governance board representative, how do you vote? I vote yes. All right, all in favor, please say aye. 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 No abstention, item 12.02 passed unanimously. No 13, so we move to 14.01, discussion and action to approve memorandum of understanding between San Jose Federation of Teachers, Local 957, AFT, AFL, CIO, and the Eastside Union High School District regarding school reopening for 2021-2022, return impacts and effects. Mr. Tom Wynn, Associate Superintendent of Human Resources. Thank you, Madam President. This is a MOU with uh, adult education uh, teachers and would enable them to have the option uh, of hosting some of the classes online or virtually. Um, we, we met with uh, Mr. Barnes regarding this and um, the, the staff has, has read it and they agree with it. Uh, one thing to know about this, and as we mentioned previously, is that adult education is, is funded very differently than our regular programs. Uh, that's all, oh, it's funded very differently than our regular programs. Um, so there are different requirements and parameters and these will, uh, will fall under those guidelines. Um, and also, um, they serve a different population. They're all adult students. And so um, with those two variants between the adult education program and, and our regular programs, we feel comfortable um, that we can make this accommodation for that staff. I need motion. Oh, go ahead, uh, board member Cotisi. Um, I, I will move to approve. And I just want to comment that I think this is an important accommodation for our adult learners, um, COVID or no COVID. I mean, I have a, a, an adult son who got his bachelor's degree and is working on a master's degree largely online, and that works for him. And I think we need to, as, as customer service orientation, I, I think we need to um, meet, meet our adult learners where they are. So I, I'm very supportive of this. All right. Second? Second. Uh, right now, right now Chavez, second. Uh, a student governing board representative, Paula, how do you vote? I vote yes. And also like this brings back to like one of my points previously about also making like the, well, like when talking about like the meetings being virtual, I think also like kind of like updating this MOU given like the pandemic is just gonna help so many people be able to um, participate in their classes, especially given like the tasks and like um, home responsibilities. So I think this is a great um, initiative and I vote yes. Thank you for your comments and your vote. All in favor, please say aye. 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 No abstention. Item 14.01 uh, passed unanimously. We move on to consent calendar 16 and 20. We I need a motion. For approval of consent calendar. All right. All in, oh, uh, student governing board. Uh, Paula, how do you vote? I vote yes. <laughs> All in favor, please say aye. 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 No abstention. Uh, section 1620 passed unanimously. We move to, well, we don't have anything for 21. So move to 22 future agenda items. Uh, opportunity for board of trustee to request item on future agendas. Um, anyone has any requests? No, uh, I like to have a request. Um, I often heard that even though the feeder district during the pandemic, uh, the student could not catch up, you know, the level of reading and math. And I was wondering for our high school, I'm sure that I remember someone mentioned to me that some of our students could not read the level of English or uh, could not do the math to the, the level that they're supposed to be. And I, I, I trigger with that is how could we find out that type of report? Uh, how do we know in order for us to support those students that could not reach the level they're supposed to be, you know, on the level of English and math? So I think I'm gonna give it up to the district 
uh, Mr. Superintendent, and you know, you can address it or you can bring the back the report or your comments on this. I think we'll discuss it as a team and talk about essentially in, in the past, how we've been able to utilize through our core data warehouse, how we look back into our students' history. We are a unique district in that we are a, a, a 912 district, right? And so we don't necessarily have a ton of input on the K-8 experience. And then we receive that student, we move on. We've done some work as the East Side Alliance are working with our feeder districts, but I think it would be helpful for you all to know that you know, as our system, this is how we look back. This is what the type of data we look at. Um, this is how we schedule and this is how we intend to provide support. And we'll we'll find a way to fashion that, that narrative for you and get it to you. Any comments, uh, Ms. Teresa Marcus? Do you? Uh, yeah, so one of the things that we're working on as part of the MTSS is what we call universal screeners at the tier one level. And so we are starting with what we call the DRP, the degrees of reading power, which we're hoping to be implemented across um, so that uh, we have students reading level. And so the teachers are able to actually use the data to inform their instruction within the classroom. On the math side, we're working with our subject area coordinator, Mr. Yi, um, to really work with fellow math teachers to look at what is that equivalent to a DRP so that it's a diagnostic where we could really assess where are the students gaps um, in terms of skills and how do we then respond? Not to say you don't belong in this class, right? But what are the gaps that um, exist so that we can kind of see where do I start from and then how do you, uh, how do you, how do I accelerate you um, so that you have the skills necessary to find success? That's awesome. So maybe that's some report that the uh, district can bring it back maybe uh, in spring. Mm -hmm. uh, so we just have an idea, you know, and, you know, to identify maybe those area that we need to push more effort or resource to support our student. Whether Thank it's you. a separate item or we embed it into the RM and MTSS discussion as a whole, we'll figure that out and make sure that we address the item. All right. Thank you. And uh, no other future agenda. So we move to, oh, yeah, um, uh, Paula, Student Governance Board. Sorry, I didn't no, see. Paula, so did next time, wanna... I think you sit next to um, uh, Superintendent. I know. Uh, yeah. So I can see you. Sorry. Yeah, go ahead, Paula. Yeah, I was just going to say, um, I think that the English learners, oh my God, oh, I'm already stumbling on the words, English language learners presentation was really well done. I think it was like hit so many different marks in terms of like intersectionality and really seeing like the numbers in our district, but actually applying them, and like seeing how that impact things like such as graduation rates. And with that, I want to know if it would be, if it would be possible to have that presentation like be presented at the next student governing board meeting, which our next meeting is on um, October 18th, I believe. I know this is a Monday and then it starts at 4 p.m. Absolutely, Ms. Guerrero and I will be there. Awesome, Paula. All right, board member Do, you have a comments? I always appreciate when uh, principal come and give presentations. Um, it give a, us a glimpse of the school uh, if we're unable to visit that school at that time. Uh, and I love the eloquence and how that, you know, the big pictures of what every principal presented to us. If it's possible, I also would like to request that when principal come to us, talk to us some of the basic fundamental um, at the school, right? You know, the very basic need. Um, uh, um, uh, I'll talk about the safety, right? Are, are the students that the teachers feel that they're getting uh, too safe at that school? Are they getting the, the basic supply they needed? Uh, and, and, and whether the, you know, something boring, but mundane, like the bathroom, is it clean, is it sanitary? Uh, and I'm not talking about the new union building, but also the, and the quad, what the students are using, right? If we adults are not comfortable using it, perhaps our students are not. Um, and we wanna talk about some very basic stuff, right? You know, our staff getting what they needed to you know, get their job done. And I think that's something that Mr. Julio Pato mentioned earlier. Uh, so. I love to embed that into that conversation, you know, maybe two or three slides rather than an entire presentation on it, but getting us, talk to us about the very basic, what our students and needs are, and, and talk to us about, you know, you know how our students are, um, are progressing, right? All that is very important. So thank you. All right. 
Um, so we move to 23.01. Should I move on my right side? Uh, board member Patty Cotizzi, any comments? Um, no, just, I mean, I'm thrilled that um, we have our new student board rep um, very engaged in the conversation. I'm, I'm appreciating your contribution. Of course, it was great to be with uh, the student governing board uh, during their um, fall training gathering. I got to meet so many of them in person that I've not ever seen before, except uh, over this thing. Um, so that was really great. Uh, I don't wanna steal Paula's thunder, but um, uh, I'm just excited about the work uh, that our student leadership are doing and uh, I'm really happy to be part of it. Thank you. Uh, board member, Vice President Manuel Herrera, anything? Uh, no, I do not have any comment. All right. I'll take that 30 seconds from here then. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't get to go to the uh, students' um, representative because do the Brown Act, but uh, should my colleagues are particularly busy one of these days, let me know and, and I'll, I'll pop in. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so Board Member Brian, do you have any more comments or that's it? Okay. Uh, board Member Chavez, any comments on your board audit committee or Santa Clara County School Board Association? Mm. So since the last board meeting, I was able to visit James Lick, Piedmont, Gailero. Thank you all for, for hosting me and um, love meeting the students, um, meeting some of the staff seeing the magic happen in one of the schools, had a really cool um, wellness fair led by a lot of student groups. I thought that was pretty amazing. There was this one booth y'all where there were dogs, dogs on campus and they were all trained. They were all in a little areas, one of the booths, but the kids would just, the students would just go to them and it, it calmed them. It, it was crazy. I wanted to go to the dogs you like the radiated towards them you're like whoa and it just so that was just one of the things wrote little notes um on trees for for the kids so it was really beautiful that happened at Piedmont so thank you um and thank you for the swag I'm not going to name the schools but some of them have been very very kind like I don't know that I wear them at board meetings but I wore them out in the community for sure um and then lastly um I also attended with um Patty um, Eastside Spartan Promise Scholarship Awards, um, which was really nice to see our students across the district um, receive scholarships um, through the Eastside Foundation. Um, just seeing the diversity and seeing, seeing our students benefit from this program, um, this collaboration that we have with the university and getting automatic acceptance, they meet the, the requirements. I thought that was super powerful and hearing their stories um, just it, it, it reminds you of why you do the work. Um, so I, I left feeling really energized. Um, yeah, so those, that's some of my reports from what's happened between meetings. And uh, in a few days, I'll be at a few more school sites. I won't say which ones, but uh, thank you in advance school sites and I'll report back next time. Awesome, that's awesome. I probably gonna have to uh, follow your footstep. Board member Chavez is gonna start to have my scheduled to visit some school. Uh, for my part, uh, I uh, want to say thank you to all uh, teacher staff, you know, and especially those one that have the presentation that work very hard, you know, for our student. And um, the committee of the Moon Festival will have a thank you party uh, to appreciate our student that who volunteer at the event like volunteer from YB uh, Interactor area six, seven, eight. Uh, also for uh, Vietnamese Educator Parent Association uh, and for um, the bond manager department, uh, Mr. Lucas, Julio Lucas. And any board member would like to uh, come will be this Sunday um, at YB at the Quad. So you can join for a little bit lunch. So I welcome to everyone to come, including superintendent, as well as any um, associate superintendent. If you have time, stop by. 
um, that's something that I really cherish, um, you know, the relationship among the community as well as the East Side. And I'm very proud of our students, our teachers and our staff. And that's something that really motivates me uh, to be on the school board and took a lot of time to um, also visit school and understand the issue so we can um, analyze it and find out the solution, how we're gonna support everyone. So that's my uh, comments. I'm gonna ask uh, Paula Escobar, a student governance board representative. Any comments, Paula? Um, at the moment, no. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. We're so glad that you be on board and you know start the whole process with the support of our uh, you know board, uh, Patty Cortese. Uh, Mr. Glenn Vanderzy, superintendent, any comments? Yeah, a couple of weeks ago, I had the opportunity to spend a Saturday with a great group of people as they had a retreat and uh, got to know our board a little better and talked about really where we want to go and, and how we want to um, interact with all our groups and keep our focus on where we want to go. And I just want to appreciate the openness and, and that discussion. A week later, I got to spend another Saturday with another group of people, and that was the student governing board. And just to, to be with the, uh, those students, um, to hear how they're showing up with each other as people they've never met and the willingness to work together, to lift up issues, to figure out how they're gonna problem solve when they disagree, how they're gonna choose to communicate with our larger student body, lift stuff up, be representative for voices beyond their, themselves. Just, just I'm really proud of it. I love the work that we're doing in end services and developing the student voice and student equity. Uh, committees that are going to be on our campus. I think that's fantastic. But I also want to thank um, Julio for his message tonight. And I want to thank the members of uh, ESTA for their openness and working with members of the organization to help resolve issues. And I think just the MOU between the district and our adult education staff also speaks to our collaboration. And I, I mention that because we've been in school for a little bit and a lot of people are tired, <laughs> right? And, and it's been hard. It's been hard for students. I think students have been expressing that like, whoa, you know, there were, you know, there were times in distance learning that when it was too much, you could just kind of maybe lean back a little bit and, and, and not anymore. And our, and our teachers and our staff um, are working and providing that, that teaching and that providing for that learning and those services that they provide. I just want to I get that those are muscles that we haven't worked for 18 months and now we're 10 weeks in and starting to hurt a little bit. But I haven't heard anybody back off of what we want to build. I haven't heard anybody back off from results, demonstrate a non-willingness to be about it. But I just want to thank everybody in our, in our educating community for the work they're doing and also for the way that we have adults and student groups have been choosing to communicate with each other in a positive manner towards resolution. I think that's awesome. And our community as a whole benefits from it. Awesome. Thank you, Superintendent Glenn Vandersey. For board meeting evaluation, I, I think is the, we have a very good discussion, with the presentation of uh, Director of Instruction, Marta Guerrero, about English language learner. Very important, you know, presentation. Uh, we also have the, you know, the discussion and action, pass and no pass, but you know, the total uh, time that we evaluated, I think is very important, you know, for those presentation as well as a discussion about coronavirus, you know, the number um, has been down. And I'm really glad to hear that, to see the number that's really down. So technically is, uh, and the discussion about the uh, approved memorandum between federal F teachers. I think all those important subjects and we will appreciate the public comments from Julio Pardo, uh, President CSEA, that uh, we understood the, the hard work of staff and it was, uh, you know, probably we'll work together and support, you know, our staff as well as teacher and now a student for many more resources that we could. 
Yes, board member um, Patty Cotizzi. I just want to um, acknowledge um, my colleagues. Um, I thought that our comments were on point. Sometimes I feel like we you know, can tend to comment to comment. And I think tonight we were very focused and, um, you know, we're make, saying things that we're really forwarding the work um, without being redundant. And so um, I think it makes for an efficient meeting. We're, we're out here at eight o'clock. <laughs> right. Uh, so 24.1, no legal counsel. All right. There are no actions. Yeah, no report. action. Okay, then the meeting adjourns. We will see you on October 21st.